what they know. Strong executives have an aura about them that commands respect and inspires a following. Our graduate programs and our professional designations do a wonderful job of building up our technical competencies. They talk about some of these higher level competencies, but they really don't train us to embody them in the presence of others. This is what we intend to develop today. At Executive Finance, we focus on executive development for the financial professional. We develop courses and programs that take you from where your professional certification uh, ends or your MBA or whatever education you have ended and show you a path toward the executive suite. We describe this as from the cubicle to the corner office. And who doesn't want to be in the corner office? Yeah, and so let's just walk through that path and what it may feel like if you're to holistically stand back and, and look at your career. Now, does your career sometimes feel like a, a long, random walk? Do you feel frustrated by the lack of promotions? Because for many of us in the early years, we, we get some sort of formal education behind us, either through university or college. We then may go on to do further education. Some of us go on to do a financial designation, such as a CPA or a CFA. And then we spend a number of years during our career focusing in on the technical mastery of all of those skills that embody finance. Ultimately, though, a lot of us have our eyes uh, set on the, the corner office and really focusing in on how do we become that ultimate financial executive. We believe that those that make it to the top have a plan and they invest in themselves to ensure that they have the skills required to get to that executive position that they want. So let's just kind of uh, give you a little bit of a, a story about Jen and myself just to kind of get us started and give you some context for what we're going to uh, share with you tonight in the Success Secrets. Uh, the story I'm going to tell you is a story where I uh, went for my first uh, executive appointment. Well, I've been working in uh, public practice and in the industry as a financial analyst for about a dozen years at this point in my career. And I kind of felt frustrated by the pace of my career development because I really did aspire towards that executive office. Uh, I had left um, the, the uh, utility that I was working for, which was a very good job, to go work in uh, an, entrepreneurial an entrepreneurial environment. And we were working at turning around a seafood company. And this is about a dozen or so years ago. And after a few months of trying to turn around this seafood company, I was working on behalf of the board, kind of as a consultant. I kind of got frustrated because I had a lot of good ideas uh, with how to turn around this company. I was really unable to execute on these ideas. And so this company was down in the United States. Jen and I live up here in Canada. And on the flight back to Canada, I wrote my boss a, a, a memo entitled 101 Things to Do with This Particular Company. And so when I landed uh, at the airport, I actually emailed this list to him. And the next morning, I got that call. And that call came along with the, the message of, well, what would you like me to do with this memo, Blair? And this was my golden opportunity, my golden opportunity to ask for anything. And so I kind of went for it. I swung, I swung for the fences, if you will. And so I said, well, how about you make me president of this particular company that we're trying to turn around? And to, to my boss's credit, he was a director on the board. He said, sure. But he gave me one condition. And the condition was that I had to convince the other executives working in this company that they would accept me as their leader. And so the next week, we flew down to this, uh, the head office. And we sat around a boardroom table. There was eight of us. And uh, we asked the, uh, and one by one, I was sitting right there as my boss went through and he pointed to each, each executive and said, you know, I, this is what I'm thinking about doing. I'm going to make Blair president of this company. What do you think? So a rather awkward moment, but interesting, extremely. And so one by one, each executive looked at me. And, and again, they were, they were very authentic in their approach, but they, they all seemed to uh, agree on one thing that I should not be the president of this company. <laughs> and so well, they said that, you know, Blair is, uh, well, too young at the time. Blair uh, doesn't know this particular industry. Blair's only been with this company for a few months. Blair actually doesn't even live in the city, which is all very good, good reasons. So coming out of this, I recognize that you just don't land in executive positions. And, I, and this is a very important lesson for me in learning about uh, the importance of relationship management, which is one of the things that we're gonna talk about uh, this evening. Now, spin forward a dozen or so years from now, 
Uh, I've actually been a CFO four times, and now I regularly get opportunities to become an executive of various companies. So what have I learned in those dozen or so years that um, takes you from being that really strong financial professional into a sought after financial executive? And you want to tell us a little bit of story uh, from your side? Sure. It hasn't always been an easy path for me either. I worked through the ranks of a large electric utility and then eventually took a position as executive VP of a gold mining company, as shown in the bottom photo. So this is actually me with uh, some of our mine management working at turning around, um, literally working in operations at a gold mine in Northern Ontario. But uh, also during that time, during the time that I was climbing the ranks from a, a junior accountant at uh, Ernst & Young to uh, working through investor relations and strategy and, and developing my career, I also had four amazing daughters, um, who you can see in the top picture, who are now aged 12 to 18. So trying to balance the two roles has never been easy. Uh, but I've somehow made it work through passion, perseverance, and focus, uh, not to mention um, lack of sleep lots of times. So the corporate ladder is filled with landmines, and believe me, I've um, stepped on a, a lot of them over the years, and I've learned many lessons from my successes and my failures through, throughout my 20-year career. So uh, but what I can tell you, though, is that once you have these executive skills that we're going to talk about tonight, you can figure out how to navigate those landmines and get the position that you want that you're proud of. So what we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to start trying to bridge, as we said, this cubicle to the corner office idea from, become, from, from uh, a position of being a technical professional where we are experts in GAAP and finance and accounting and tax, and then crossing this chasm into the executive world where we have skills that uh, allow us to demonstrate strategic thinking, where we're influential in the executive, in the boardroom, where we have leadership capabilities, not, not only within our own teams, but broadly as a business partner and a trusted advisor across the organization. So uh, what we find though, is that as you're going along this, this path, you may have some, some fears and some things that are holding you back. So perhaps you're a highly competent financial professional, but you've got some of these types of challenges, like the I'm not ready yet myth, so, or other negative self-talk that's stopping you from being the best that you can, that you've got any, some lingering doubts that you can actually be successful in an executive role. You question your effectiveness, and you're afraid of rejection. You're afraid of not getting the job you want, or maintaining the relationships with important contacts, not having your ideas considered. These things will really hold you back. You know, some of us also may have felt like this, feeling like kind of a, an outsider, kind of looking in, watching others succeed uh, around you, your peers being promoted or getting those executive positions. And you're asking yourself the question, well, why isn't it that I am getting those positions? I'm equally qualified. I have equal uh, technical expertise. Why am I not noticed? when it comes to making these opportunities happen. So that too is another thing that we may be feeling. Or perhaps you have a vision for what you want to accomplish, but finding the time to get there and the means to make it happen just seems to elude you. You are so overwhelmed with the day-to-day -day of your current job that you just feel defeated and don't really know how to get ahead. You feel as though others outside of finance don't get you and they don't respect what you do or your level of competency. Or perhaps you're spending all of your time just trying to keep up with the financial matters. You know, we talk to a lot of financial professionals. And imagine uh, uh, in these conversations with whether you're in the controller's office or in the FP&A analysis side, I mean, you're just trying to keep up with all of what you've got on your desk, let alone having the opportunity to step back and look at the bigger picture of how the, all these pieces fit together. Or you're terrified of meeting new people. Don't we all feel that? Uh, or you may have the belief that you don't need to network. You're an expert, and you should, that should be enough to access the growth opportunities that you want. But nobody's calling you. Or how about this one? You're smart. You're a self-moted finan financial professional with big dreams and bold aspirations, kind of like I was a dozen years ago. But I really had troubles 
uh, having people pay attention to me. And so, or perhaps it's a situation where your credibility has been dealt a, a blow for whatever reason. And we've seen this time and time again, because oftentimes we're called into a turnaround situations and you want to desperately regain that level of trust with those key stakeholders, whether they're the CEO, the board, or other executives around the organization. Or you hate presenting. You hate presenting ideas in front of a small group and are terrified of presenting in, in front of a large group. Your audience looks bored with what you have to say. Your presentations get derailed because you lose your train of thought and freeze on the spot. And the outcomes of your presentations never go as you plan. You want people to listen to you, but they just don't. And so you also get into situations where we have significant challenges. Challenges like you know, doing large integrations or speeding up your financial close. And these are daunting tasks in the, um, in the reality of your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, world. And so sometimes you're unable to follow through with your original vision. The best of intentions don't manifest themselves in tangible results. How many of you hold the title you want, but don't feel like you're fulfilling the role? You're not getting the respect you deserve. Are you really just a glorified accountant as opposed to the controller or CFO, uh, that, that title that you hold? So if any of these sorts of fears or obstacles kind of resonate with you, these are what we hear from our clients. These are things that Jen and I have felt in our own careers at one point or another. And so what we've done is we've actually gone back and studied what is it that makes financial executives, the seven-figured financial CFOs, great in the roles that they play. How do you get those roles where you make that kind of money? So one piece of thought leadership that we're going to share with you as we dive into these success secrets of these seven-figured CFOs comes from FBI, the Financial Executives uh, International. And they've done a number of different uh, research studies. And they, one such study came out a few years ago, and it talked about the CFO trust pyramid. And the trust pyramid talks about how we as executives need to build up trust because you can't overnight be suddenly become uh, an executive. At the foundational level, it means we've got to do all of the, the blocking and tackling, the financial reporting, the integrity, the controls. That's the base level. You can't be a trusted advisor or a, an influencer of the, the board and the CEO in the absence of having good control over the financial uh, back office traditional function of, of uh, finance. At the second level, as you move up this pyramid, you become that business partner. You're able to add value. You're respected by your peers across the organization. And you promote ethical business practices. And so this too increases your level of trust. But the penultimate uh, actually occurs when you achieve leadership and you become that number two person in the organization. You're a strategic advisor to the CEO and the board of directors. You're a strong communicator and you're an integral part of the success that drives a business uh, forward. That is the ultimate uh, position for a financial executive. And if you take a look at how these, this trust pyramid ties, ties into a lot of our daily lives is that you know, we can get our minds around the bottom part of this pyramid very easily. However, it's a lot less tangible as you move up this pyramid. And if you take a look at the level of influence you have, the further up you get this go on this trust pyramid, the more success you're going to have in, in becoming influential inside your organization. Presence are the difference between a financial professional and a financial executive. For a financial executive, it's accepted and expected that you've mastered your technical competencies. So you're great at accounting, you're great at financing, you know treasury, tax, regulatory, and legal. It's also assumed that your enabling competencies are well honed. So these are all the things around Excel, supervising people, being great at managing your staff, having business acumen, you know, really understanding your business inside and out. But what ultimately differentiates you is how you demonstrate each of the traits of your executive presence. And that is the success secret. 
how you get executive presence and what are the competencies that compose that? So the first step you've got to have is a little bit of self-awareness and building this self-awareness is a lot more involved than many of you may think because there really isn't a prescribed roadmap from once you become a financial professional, once you get a designation or once you graduate from college or university toward that office of the financial executive. What do you do between those two points? And so um, the first step is to really understand where you have strengths and weaknesses in your own skill sets across those technical, enabling, and uh, executive presence competencies that we're going to talk about. So you also may have uh, blind spots. So these are the things that you don't know other people are saying about you. So maybe you're not good at making eye contact. Maybe you don't have a good handshake. Maybe you always say no as a first response or yes, but, which we all know means no. Uh, maybe you overreact to every situation. Maybe you're negative. I mean, there's all kinds of things that are blind spots that you may not realize you're doing, but these things will absolutely derail your career. Absolutely. And so there's, a, and there's a, uh, an expression I'm fond of. You don't know what you don't know. And these are what typically refer to as blind spots. And so part of uh, what we're talking about this tonight is really shedding some light on your blind spots and further developing that. So if we were to think about how other people talk about us behind closed doors, what are your superiors? What are your bosses and your supervisors saying about you behind closed doors? Or and, even your peers, right? It's or, not just your supervisors. Absolutely. It's and, everybody you work with. And so what are some of the things they may be saying? They might say, you know, he's brilliant, but he's not well liked. Just doesn't connect with people. Or perhaps they're saying something along the lines that you're, you always look a little nervous or you're a little too stiff in conversations and presentations. That's a common one for us financial executives. Uh, or that you're, you know, technically gifted, but you just can't communicate. Absolutely. Another one that's common. Or perhaps that uh, you don't dress well or your clothes don't fit well. And that, too, reflects on your, your personal brand. Or that you're easily distracted and you go into far too much detail. Also, another common problem for financial professionals. Yeah, and a common challenge, just given all the complexity and the technical details of GAAP and finance and tax and all the stuff we have to deal with on a, on a day in, day out basis. Yeah, so how do you take that information that's so complicated and present it in a way that your users are going to, to take action and get the story? So uh, you may also come across as tentative and meek and just really lacking confidence. Yeah, so when we go into those all-important meetings, whether it's with uh, the management team or the executive team or the board of directors, coming off as the best version of ourselves when we, met, when we present. So what we do for our clients is help to identify their strengths and weaknesses and to reveal your blind spots. We have a proven process for helping financial professionals elevate their executive presence. And so in this study that was done by Ernst and Young a few years ago, and it was entitled The DNA of the CFO. Okay. So they provided a toolkit for the aspiring CFO that laid out the top skills that respondents feel they needed to develop the most. And interestingly, you'll see a lot of these skills around communication and influencing skills, skills to manage upward, so relationship management. And presentation skills are all were the top three skills that were identified by Ian Y of this study uh, of skills most lacking and in most need uh, of development. And so tonight, we're actually going to try to tackle off one of these skills and give you some tangible action items uh, and to take away and start practicing tomorrow. So tonight we're going to teach you the three ways to become a better communicator and have more influence with the people you work with. These are tips and tools that you can put into place right away and start you right on the path to where you want to be. You need to communicate with passion and precision. You need to have the ability to speak on your feet and cue your style off the reactions of the audience. Know your audience and know what they need. You need to present ideas with passion and energy. And you need to listen and respond to others with empathy and adjust your message according to what they need. Okay, so the first idea I want to share with you, and this is an interesting one for financial professionals, 
is to actually look at what makes for persuasive communication. And we don't like to believe, we don't like to believe that persuasive communication comes from uh, the data and the analysis that we provide in finance and accounting, the financial statements. But interestingly, that is not the secret to persuasive communications. And in fact, if you, did, if you were to actually look back 3,000 years before uh, Christ was born, we had a man by the name of Aristotle who first identified these, these principles of persuasive communication. And, and at that time, he called them ethos, pathos, and logos. And so I like using the original source when it comes to talking about these items because I find those easier to remember. But in all of our research since then, you'll see anybody talking about persuasive communication is referencing these three uh, principles to one degree or another. And so let me just start by talking about what is logos. And logos is your logical argument. This is your data analysis. This is the financial statements, financial indicators that we are so uh, adept at performing and providing to our stakeholders. So generally speaking, when we coach people on logos, we, we actually don't talk that much because financial professionals tend to uh, play uh, or overweight the importance of logos when it comes to communicating information. You know, we think about when you went to school to become a, an accountant, you love numbers, you love being able to make things balance, don't you, Blair? <laughs> I do love that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that sometimes, you know, it becomes, we think that that's enough. But it's not. It's not. <laughs> and so what we do is we, we, we talk with our, our, with our clients um, around the other two principles of persuasion. And the first one I'm going to share with you is your ethos. It's your credibility. Credibility is extremely important when it comes to persuading the audience to actually listen to you. And isn't that what we want to have our stakeholders do? We want people to listen because in, in our minds, in the way we think, and we see in the data and the analysis that we perform, we know that there's answers. Somebody should be doing something about, say, these variances or, or these issues that we see. And so uh, the first element is to focus on our credibility. People have to believe us. They have to trust us. We must come across as trustworthy. And you can build your ethos through a, a number of different um, avenues. I mean, first of all, many of us are professional um, professionals, whether we're a, a CPA or a CFA or, or we have a university education, that too builds our, our credibility. But oftentimes, you can think much more broadly about credibility. So for instance, if you're bringing in industry stats and benchmarking your results against industry stats, that's an example of building your credibility uh, and using your ethos. So uh, you'll notice in a lot of the stuff, even that E&Y study that I just quoted a few minutes ago, it's not just Jen and I making up these things. We've done a considerable amount of research as to what it takes to succeed in that role of the executive. And by leaning on some of these sources, we're building ethos with you, our audience. The, the third part of the principles of persuasion is your pathos. It's your connection that you make to your audience. And this one's a big stretch for folks in finance and accounting because we rarely think about the emotional connection that we make with our audience. And so we're going to share with you some ideas as to how you can make connection with your audience. How can your message be remembered? How does it tap into the emotions of people so that they, um, they, they feel the message that you're, that you're making? And the reason why this is so important is it's fairly, it's, it's fairly intuitive, but le not intuitive, in the sense that the left side of our brain processes logic. However, that left side of our brain doesn't function very fast. However, the right side of our brain is our intuition. And our intuition, on the other hand, moves at a very fast speed. We make intuitive judgments in a matter of seconds, almost instantaneously. So, if you're, and pathos taps into the right side of the brain, where logos taps into the left side. So that's why when we communicate, we must have pathos in mind. What is the connection that we make to our audience? Yeah, and this is so important because uh, the warmth factor is more important in people making decisions and wanting to do business with you uh, than your competence. So making sure that you are passionate, likable, empathetic, 
is incredibly important to getting where you want to go. Yeah, so if you want to be more influential with your stakeholders, you need your audience to feel your message. And this is a big stretch for, uh, for your, your, the finance and accounting folks that we're talking to. So let's move on and talk about some ideas around how we can develop pathos. And perhaps one of the best ways is to talk about storytelling. Yeah, so storytelling is extremely important. And you might think, I'm presenting my financial statements and my variances. How can I tell a story around that? There's always a story. No matter what it is you're presenting, there's a story. So storytelling is one of the most powerful ways to put ideas into the world today. They're creative a conversion of life itself into more powerful, clearer, more meaningful experience. It really is what makes you remember a message when you, are, you, you hear about a story. So when Blair told you the story of um, you know, wanting to be the CEO, you thought, wow, that took a lot of guts for him to come out and do that, but it makes you remember it. So those are the kinds of things that will really have an impact. And stories have been used since the beginning of mankind to share valuable lessons from one generation to the next beginning with cave drawings, the Bible, fables, legends, to case studies. Stories are extremely powerful. When we tell stories, we hold the attention of our audience for longer periods of time. So what types of stories can we talk about here, Jen? Well, Blair and I love stories. We, we use them all the time in our, um, our teaching and our coaching because they really have an impact. And you can see how um, other people have made poor decisions and what the consequences have been from that, how they've been able to learn from it. So we've got negative stories, such as this example of Lehman Brothers, that um, will, will tell them what you shouldn't be doing when you're, when you're looking at any, any kind of situation. But we also have positive stories. So stories of success, stories where people have been able to, to you know, to overcome challenges and be successful and that is very effective for motivating and empowering our audience to strive for higher things so when you're thinking of how are you going to tell a story about your financial results there's all kinds of business themes that can be used to weave any situation into an interesting and compelling story we can all imagine how each of these stories can be woven into financial results so in doing so you can make people dying to listen to your latest financial results. I'm a bit of a stress there, Jim. <laughs> yeah, dying. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe they're not dying to listen, but at least, at least they'll stay awake and they'll actually pay attention and they'll remember. They'll remember what it is that you're telling them and what you want them to know. More than just a bunch of boring numbers. Exactly. It's extremely important to remember that there is always a story to tell about anything that we're, we're required to present. So your financial results are up. Is this a story of a great management team, the story of a magnificent turnaround, or a groundbreaking new product? Think about what story will resonate with your audience and get the results you want. So here's some themes of things that you can look at, and these are great you know, for you to consider going forward. Maybe it's a turnaround story, how, so, how companies thrived in chaos. They said it couldn't be done. Teamwork and action. You know, there's a whole bunch here, but that's a few examples of of themes that you can use no matter what it is that you're presenting. Okay, so there's some ideas as to how you can make your message more sticky with your audience and tap into that pathos that we talked about. Here's a couple of more ideas around communicating more effectively as a financial professional that often we're not taught about in our financial training. We're definitely not taught about this. No, exactly. It, and, and interestingly, it's, it's not so much what we say, it's how we say it. Okay, so keep, I'll say that again. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. So what's the deal with this guy? He looks kind of scary. <laughs> I know, he is. He's telling you a story just by reading his body language. And in fact, there was a, uh, uh, a groundbreaking research that was done several decades ago by a sociologist, Albert Mabrium. Famously, he determined that our message, the message that we convey, comes from 7% only of what we're the, the, the what of what we say, the words we use to convey our message. Interestingly, the vast majority of our message when we're presenting comes from the tone of voice we use, and 55% of that message comes unbelievably from the nonverbal cues and the visual cues that we may um, uh, knowingly or unknowingly be, 
be putting off as we're uh, communicating our message. Wow, that's really quite phenomenal. It's, it's astounding. And so, it, again, it's, it changes the way you think when you're aware of the importance of, of some of these principles. So, for instance, when you're talking at, or presenting at a, at a management meeting or an executive meeting along those lines, you know, the, the message you say, everything must be in sync. So the message, the tone of your voice, the body language that you have has to be in sync. Because if you're saying one thing and your body language or the tone of voice is saying something else, or you're just saying it in a monotone, well, your message is much less likely to resonate with your, with your audience. And, we, and another thing we, we talk about is the importance of being aware of our facial expressions. You know, when we're sitting in the uh, meeting room and we're rolling our eyes or doing some of those things, that is, ever roll your eyes, I do, and this is something I'm, I'm very aware of, is it unwittingly, it unwittingly undermines your executive presence when you're doing these sorts of behaviors. Yeah, lots of times those are your blind spots. You really don't know what it is that you're doing. That's, that's making you unappealing. Absolutely. And so when we have this, this uh, idiosyncrasy where our message and our body language and our tone aren't in sync, what ends up happening is our listeners are getting confused uh, because the words and the body language aren't saying the same message. And as a result, your message isn't coming through. It isn't resonating and you lose your influential impact. So, for example, here's an, another example uh, around the tone of your voice. For instance, think of your voice acting as a highlighter when you're speaking. And so you can see, I've got the same sentence presented, you know, five different ways. The first time, I've shown it as a monotone. If I was just to read, the competition is stealing our customers. But if I raise my intonation to emphasize the competition is stealing our customers, or the competition is stealing our customers, if I can change any word in those sentences by raising or lowering my voice, emphasizing one word, and you get a totally different message just by changing the tone of your voice. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And this is uh, really important. If your listeners look bored, it's because you're boring. I mean, that's, that's really true. And um, that's gonna seriously impact on how your message gets across and that the results that you want from your presentation or your message don't, don't happen because they're just really not paying attention. So a few of the tips you want us to uh, consider, if you speak too fast, you tend to convey the message that you're nervous and you're inexperienced. I remember back in the day when I used to uh, leave uh, voicemail messages and it was so fast that you couldn't almost uh, differentiate the words. So that is something that takes a conscious effort to, to control. Or if you speak too slowly, you tend to convey the that you're a slow thinker, that you're really not uh, on top of your game. If you speak too softly, you imply that you're bored, tired, or shy, and that doesn't get your message across. Or if you're too loud, you come across as angry, defiant, aggressive, that also doesn't work. So there's so many things that you need to consider. Oh, and there's Oliver, he's, he's, he's talking loud. He's coming across as aggressive with the cat. Uh, so. Uh, what we know, though, is that many great presenters, they vary their pace and their tone throughout their presentation. It holds the audience interest and it gets their message across in a really effective way. So here are your three takeaways to put into, into practice right away. Ethos and pathos are really what you need to get influence. We all have logos that comes with being financial professionals but we really need to master our credibility and our likability. Storytelling is going to help your message be remembered. No matter what it is you're presenting, there's always a story that goes along with it. And it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Think about your tone, your body language, your gestures, your posture, the, the, the um, sound of your voice, Facial expressions, all of these things are extremely important in how you present. Think about the greatest presenters you know and how good they are with all of these things. All right, so in a study by the Center of Talent Innovation, 26% of what it takes to get promoted is your presence, your executive presence. And so 
Jen, maybe we should go in and really share what some of some of the other secrets are of the seven-figured CFOs. Okay, so here are the secrets. These are the traits that are going to get you from the cubicle to the corner office. And you should write this down if you want to get promoted or land an executive position. These are the skills that you must master, whether you learn them from us or pursue them on your own. Absolutely. And we've thought about this for a long, long time. We've, we've tested this on multiple executives that we coach uh, across a variety of industries. And these are the skills that you need to have to be successful. If you really are serious about working your career uh, forward towards the, the corner office. And so Jen, we just talked about communication. Yeah, communication is incredibly important. Resilience, how do, you, how do you bounce back? Credible leadership. Personal branding, what do people think of you? Confidence. And building relationships. So let's just give you a preview of kind of what are involved in each one of these uh, six uh, traits of executive presence and beginning with resilience because what resilience means is how you persevere in the face of adversity. How do you stay um, focused on achieving a long-term goal? Um, and, and whether it's to integrate a company or change an ERP, and whatever it takes, that's all an element of, of perseverance. So how do we act with urgency and intention every single day? How do we accept and own accountability? How do we set long-term goals that are ultimately achieved through deliberate practice and a, a practice called nudging? Another thing that's important about resilience, this is the standoff point, is how do you recover when things don't work out well? You know, we all have challenges. We have personal challenges. We don't get the job we wanted. We don't get the promotion. We get fired. We get laid off. We, I've been there you know, through a lot of those different things. We've all had adversity at one point in our career. Exactly. Right? And sometimes it happens, it happens over and over again. But how do you bounce back? And in fact, some of the greatest uh, people in the world, whether it's Richard Branson or, or Bill Gates or, or Steve, Steve Jobs. Jobs, they've all overcome uh, uh, adversity and gone on to be extremely successful. So what are the traits? How can we actually stimulate resilience in our executive presence? And so we've got a few ideas there. You also have to show strong, credible leadership. So we talked about ethos and the credibility factor, how important it is with your communications. But credibility uh, covers you in all aspects. You have to be able to change your mindset from what's in it for you to what's in it for others. So how is your behavior uh, modeling the best thing for your peers, your employees, and your, um, your supervisors, your company? You have to have a vision and you have to share it broadly. And you have to be able to establish and maintain the highest levels of integrity and trust. And this goes across the board with everything that you're doing, both within your organization and, you know, as we would say, off the court. Okay, next we're going to talk about personal branding. Okay. Hey, does anyone really have a personal brand? I mean, that's not something that a lot of financial executives or most financial executives even consider. Do you even know what that is? Well, and for me personally, I never thought about personal branding until a couple of years ago until I met Jen. Well, you know, you know me. We've known each other for about 20 years, but we really just started working together a couple of years ago. Absolutely. And then and that's what it really resonated with me, the importance of establishing a personal brand. What are you known as? What is the best representation of your skill set, of your strengths, of your interests, of your career aspirations? That, those are all elements that uh, compose your personal brand. And so as you go about setting a personal brand, First of all, you need to have a clear and specific career goal. And then you work through a process of developing a plan of action to achieve that goal. And again, it's not something you wake up overnight and you go from the cubicle to the corner office. For some of us, it can take months, years. Uh, it can take decades. A, well, we're not decades. We're going to try to do better <laughs> than decades. But when you know, when you're self-aware, as we go back to that idea of being self-aware of where we have strengths and weaknesses and what we need to work on, 
and what it takes to be a really great financial executive, then we can accelerate this process, this path between the, the cubicle and the corner office. Yeah, so we see this. I mean, your appearance, for example, is extremely important. There's a thing called thin slicing where people make a judgment about you within the first two seconds of when they meet you. So how you look, how you're put together from head to toe is extraordinarily important in your success. So understanding what our personal brand is, defining it for ourselves, and then going out there and communicating it and reinforcing it through our consistent behaviors uh, in our workplace, in our personal lives, through perhaps the nonprofits, organizations, or the community involvement that we find ourselves uh, engaged in. All of these things reinforce a personal brand. And in the absence of having one is that your personal brand will be defined for you. And it may not be defined in, in a favorable light. Absolutely. So perception is reality. So what people think of you becomes what, what happens in real life. Absolutely. So if you're missing deadlines or if you don't dress appropriately in the workplace or you are not very good at networking with people, these all become elements of your personal brand if you are managing your personal brand. And confidence. Confidence, uh, we love this slide because this is really, really true. You know, you really have to believe that you are that lion. You are that big, powerful presence in order to move from the cubicle to the corner office. You have to be able to be confident and present uh, and show the best version of ourselves whenever it matters most. So we can't always be, be showing that, but anytime we're in an important meeting, a job interview, a performance evaluation, um, you know, any of those high pressure situations, you wanna show the best version of yourself. You wanna be able to walk into a room and command attention. So when you go to that next networking event, you want people to look and say, hmm, I wonder who that is. Or you walk into the executive boardroom or a management boardroom and you, you want to be listened to. If you have results to present, you want people to listen, remember, and act on the results that you're presenting. And you need to look confident, but not arrogant. And that is extremely important because uh, ego and arrogance will absolutely work against you. But you have to be able to look confident and own it, whatever it is that you're, you're doing, presenting, working with, you gotta own it. You've gotta maintain poise and think clearly in stressful situations because often we are in stressful situations. We're dealing with deadlines, we're dealing with uh, difficult people, we're dealing with conflict. All of these things are very stressful, but in order to successfully manage them, you've gotta be confident. And I mean, the biggest challenge we see with a lot of our clients in, in finance and accounting is that in finance and accounting, we tend to have confidence when we've balanced everything out. Everything's been tied out, we've reconciled all the accounts, and it takes a considerable amount of time. But if you work with a lot of financial executives, they know they intuitively when the numbers are close enough. Yeah, they don't exactly. worry about tying everything out. They know when the number is approximately close enough. You know, I'm yeah. fond of this expression, it's better to be approximately correct than precisely wrong. And sometimes we, get, we have analysis by paralysis. In, in the finance and accounting function. And as a result, it, it really impinges on our confidence levels and kind of holds us back. And so when we walk in, you know, we tentatively share our data analysis and we aren't, we're afraid to put forward a recommendation as to what we think should be done. When if you want to be a, a strong executive, you need to walk into that room and have a really good recommendation as to what you're, what you're thinking. And very often, that's what differentiates a financial professional from a financial executive. And finally, we have building strong relationships. Okay, so with loyal followers and an inevitable list of contacts, when you have those kind of elements, uh, it really brings, it brings added uh, expertise and added business opportunities uh, to your personal and professional lives. So when we talk about building relationships, we're talking about how to increase our level of influence using the relationships, using our credibility with others to achieve, um, to achieve our, our goals and, and elevate our level of executive presence. Yeah, it's really important that business follows relationships, not the other way around. So you have to be able to, to 
to really clearly develop those relationships in a way that you've moved from an acquaintance to a friend, to someone that someone trusts in order for them to do business with you. Yeah, and so what we're trying to do here, and this is, a, again, a shift in mindset for us in finance and accounting, is to shift from this idea that um, we conduct business based on our competency, okay? Set that aside. Think about conducting business based on the relationships you have, the relationships with your staff, the relationships with others across the organization, managing upward, as we saw in the E&Y study, the, the relationships you have with bankers, suppliers, customers, that's the real essence of, of getting business done at the executive level, as opposed to just relying on your technical competencies. And so what you're trying to do is you're consciously developing deeper levels of relationship with people through proactive relationship management. So have, do you know, uh, go through your list of contacts right now. And what are you actually doing with each of the key people in your personal and professional lives to build deeper relationships? And to be honest, most people we talk to about this subject don't give any thought to this. It's all, yeah, they have no idea that this is something that they should actually think about. And, and why we think this is important is, to be honest, I, I, up until about a year ago, until we really started talking with more clients and, and practicing this ourselves, Jen and I didn't spend a whole lot of time in relationship management. And now it's a huge part of our executive presence is this idea of relationship management. So when you take a look at the six elements and you embody those six traits of executive presence, you know, if you embody those six traits, I call it finances, evil master plan. Yeah, that's definitely Blair's idea. <laughs> evil master plan. <laughs> Listen, this enables what I call a quiet revolution. <laughs> You become extremely powerful, extremely influential inside your organization. Yeah, and extremely valuable. Listen, we in finance, we have the best seat in the house. We see everything. Everything goes through the finance department Absolutely. At, at one point or another. There's no system that we don't have access to. There's no piece of data that we don't have access to. And so when we control all that information and we can uh, analyze it and come up with the insights and, and trusted advice from that data, that analysis, and insights, that makes us an extremely credible, trusted advisor to the CEO and the board of directors. And to the point where they start making decisions based on the recommendations that you're making. And that's what I call finance's evil master plan. Yeah, then you become a trusted advisor. You're not the back office accountant, you know, who's thought of as a cost center. You really, you have a seat at the table and that's what we all want. Exactly. And so that's what Jen and I really are all about. We're all about finding uh, tools, resources, techniques, advice, anything that can help you move beyond accounting. Yeah. And we've read 20, 30 books this year. We follow all the thought leaders. We, 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 we're very involved in what's going on from all of the research that is from psychologists and sociologists. Yeah, it's far beyond just it's, finance and accounting. It's really, it's almost no finance and accounting, really. I mean, we, we focus on a much broader view of what's going to make someone successful. Absolutely. So you want to tell them a little bit about the MBA? Sure. So this leads to our program, MBA, Move Beyond Accounting. Now, isn't that clever? So we have, we've got our own MBA. <laughs> <laughs> so you can learn more about this program at uh, www.movebeyondaccounting.com. Yeah, so let's just tell you a little bit about the program uh, as we close up the webinar here. Uh, I just give you a little bit of a preview as to what exactly we do with our clients. We offer a six-week blended learning program. And what blended learning means is that it's both uh, individual and peer-based learning. It's uh, online as well as uh, through um, uh, e-learning and, and various sources. So this program is not in person. So it doesn't matter where you live. You can do this from anywhere. Exactly. And our next offering is going to start in a couple of weeks on October the 11th. But in the first week, it's a six week program. In the first week, we drill into the, these communication skills and really elevate what it's going to take for you to be influential at the highest levels of the organization. In the second week, we talk about how you actually build out a strategic network of contacts through deeper relationships. And in the third week, we, tap, we give you some life hacks as to how you can actually elevate your level of confidence. And this, there's some cool ideas that we've come across from psychology that can make you walk into uh, any situation, any high pressure situation, 
and represent the best version uh, of yourself. A lot of these things too, we figured out ourselves just from, from practicing, right? So we, we've done it ourselves, we've learned what works, what doesn't work, and then we can share it. Yeah, and so in the fourth week, we're gonna drill into that idea of the personal brand that we spoke of earlier and to really get in the way of opportunities as opposed to just this random walk where we're hoping that opportunities uh, hit us out of the blue. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It, no. In it, real life, you got to go for it. you got to go for it, so you've got to put yourself in the way of opportunities. So how do we do that? How do we work on our LinkedIn profiles, our resumes, uh, how we dress, how we appear, all those sorts of things that factor into our, our personal brand. In the fifth week, we, we set out some pretty big goals uh, and then see and build resilience to ensure that they're, they're achieved. And when we hit potholes along the way, how do we bounce back and stay focused on achieving those big, long-term, hairy, audacious goals that we've set for ourselves? And in the final week, we talk about credible leadership. Because ultimately, as you become an executive, it's not about you. It really becomes about those around you. Yeah, you really, your job is to develop everybody else around you into leaders. And one of the most important traits, we slip the word credibility in here. This is fundamental to everything we preach uh, because we've seen so many finance functions, so many finance uh, professionals and executives who have lost their credibility. And it's a terrible, terrible shame when you lose cred credibility. The conversation entirely changes the way your, your finance function and your day-to-day entirely changes if you lack or lose credibility. And so we spend uh, the sixth week talking about leadership and credibility. Jen? Okay, so one of the things that we, we provide, which is a, an amazing tool, is our proprietary uh, CFO competency assessment. So what this does is it illuminates your own personal strengths and weaknesses, and it will shine a light on your own blind spots. This will help you even if you don't aspire to be the CFO, but you're looking for another executive role. So really understanding what you're good at and where you may need some additional help is going to make a, an enormous difference as you start along your path. Yeah, and so when you go through this competence assessment, it really it answers the question, are you ready to actually be an executive? Or maybe you're already an executive, but you aren't sure whether you have what it takes to be the most successful you could possibly be in that role. And so this competency assessment gives you some pretty powerful insight into uh, your, your current situation and gives you that development path to really excel in the, in the executive office. The other thing we, we, we do is through our program is we hook you up with your peers because there's so much that can be learned by not only communicating with Jenna and myself, but also with other people in similar situations. We work with dozens of companies uh, and dozens of ind individuals and it's amazing how much we learn from each other's situations. There's, there's all, the old expression that misery loves company. Yeah, absolutely. But we also try to move past that and actually try to provide each other with support and ideas that can be useful. Yeah, it really helps you when you feel like you're not the only one. You know, what we find with so many of these challenges that we're facing is that almost everybody feels the same way. So it's, it's huge when you have that kind of comfort that there's other people dealing with the same thing. So you'll also have access to all the slides, worksheets, and resources for our six-week MBA program. And you can catch up on any lessons that you miss. Yeah, absolutely, because everything we have is, is we, we do webinars on a weekly basis. We also have an e-learning form. And so we make sure that you get every bit of content, every one of our ideas are right there at your fingertips uh, for you to take advantage of. So here's where, if you want to learn more about this, uh, Jen alluded to this earlier, you can simply just go to the movebeyondaccounting.com website to learn all sorts or answer any of the questions you may have uh, about this program. Uh, there's even information in there that you can share with your employer to help with uh, getting sponsorship uh, if you like. Uh, and keep in mind that our next offering is actually starting two weeks from tonight, October 11th. So uh, I'm not going to say that time is of the essence, but time is kind of of the essence. It's important to know, too, that this is um, all CPD. Right? Yes, so absolutely. If you, if you are someone who requires continuing professional education, if you're a CPA, then this program will get you there. Yes, in Canada and many other. I don't think it qualifies for CPE credits in the U.S., or at least not verifiable. Though I, I am a CPA in the U.S., so everything's designed to that standard. But uh, in, in 
the, the other things we want to include, because we, we, Jen and I are really passionate about making sure that we give you everything that we know uh, when you work with us, uh, including... You'll also get two one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with either Blair or Jen. And if you're lucky, if we're available, you might get both of us. <laughs> that's always <laughs> and, <laughs> that's, You're really lucky if you get both of us. Yeah, you get the Blair and Jen show. <laughs> The other thing we want to provide you, again, just to add more value to this, is to give you complete access. We actually have over two dozen courses, two dozen courses, uh, e-learning courses that you can access on demand at any time through our e-learning library. And again, these have been designed with that path in mind, from financial professional to financial executives. And they cover off such topics as, we've got change management, strategic planning and management, how to deal with fraud, financial modeling. These are all skills that are essential to becoming an executive, but really are, are not taught or they're not taught in a way that's practical through your education process. Absolutely. And so, uh, and one, one last value we're going to throw in there. I actually wrote a book and not to plug my book too much here, but I'm going to throw in a, a copy of my book for free in this. Uh, it's, a pretty, it's actually a really good book. It's a good book. And the way it started was a, uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of turnaround companies over the last dozen of years. And what ultimately I've noticed is that what gets people into turnaround situations is a lack of appreciation. Executives that fail to appreciate fundamental financial principles. And so it's, this book is meant to be kind of your MBA in finance, but only the parts you actually really need to know to survive and thrive in the real world. And so it's a, it's a handbook. It's a handbook, but it carves out. I mean, I, I've done an MBA. Uh, and probably, you know, 80% of what you read in a finance textbook, you don't need to know in the real world. And so I've kind of stripped it down to what is the practical advice uh, that you can uh, use in your actual real world. So it's written for both non-financial executives, it's written in a lay language, but I'm pretty sure a lot of aspiring financial executives will benefit from it as well because it covers off everything, all aspects of finance, from accounting to auditing, to uh, capital markets, to uh, financial planning and analysis, budgeting, governance, everything that finance touches. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. I actually learned quite a bit from the book. <laughs> <laughs> and we provide a 30-day money-back guarantee. So you need to do the work. So you got to show up for every lesson and do all of the homework. So we will have homework for you to do. You, you want to make sure you get lots of value out of it. But if you're really not seeing the value and it's not working for you, we'll give your money back. Okay, so the, the, the cost of the program are, is $1,497. But tonight and for the next seven days until October 5th, we will provide everything for $997. And you can see that the value that you're getting is much beyond that. So $2,647 is what we yeah, value so, with that. Exactly. And so we're going we're gonna to keep this open. We're, we're gonna keep, uh, we want to keep the, uh, the cohort, the group of people that we want to put together, we're going to try to keep it to a, a small group of folks. Who are, who are going through this, this offering starting on October 11th. And so for the next seven days, and for those of you that are on the uh, call tonight, uh, the, the price will be $9.97. Okay, so once again, to register or to learn more about the program, go to movebeyondaccounting.com. 75% of uh, executives and respondents to a survey of 200 executives said that uh, ex personal presence and credibility matter a great deal in your careers. So the impact that our presence has on others is profoundly important to your career. And so Jen and I are going to ask yourself, what are you waiting what are you for? Waiting for? Yeah. In investing in yourself is the best investment you can make. And to learn more, if you have any more questions, if you're not sure if this is right for you, you can email either one of us. Absolutely. Right there. Yeah, so feel free to reach out to us either by email or connect, uh, connect through our Facebook page or our LinkedIn, uh, or just give us a call. And we'd be more than happy to talk about uh, the program, your career, and anything we could do to uh, help you be more successful. Okay, well, thank you so much. So I think that brings us to the end of the content. If anybody has any questions or follow-up, by all means, contact us. We thank you for coming out with us tonight. And we hope you enjoyed the rest of your, your evening or day, wherever you may happen to be. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye now.